friends, welcome to another episode of the Field and Garden Podcast. I'm your host, Lisa Mason Ziegler. And friends, guess what we're going to talk about today? Cool flowers. We are flooded with um, questions, comments, concerns, worries, people biting their nails. So I thought, you know what, we'll just do a little podcast about this and I'll share with you what's going on in my cool flower garden. We are now at the uh, coming to the end of January and this is 2022. And here where I am in the mid-Atlantic, um, we just had some snow and we're in pretty cold temperatures, all pretty normal for our area. And so I'm going to share with you what's going on. But first, if we've never met before, welcome. Thank you so much. I appreciate for all of you that are subscribing to my podcast. Um, You know, the more subscribers, the more people review. That means that the podcast app that you listen on will then show my podcast to people that are browsing. So I appreciate every single one of you that do that and um, just kind of makes my heart sing too. We've just hit 200,000 downloads and... We haven't even hit our first year's anniversary, and I just thank you so much for that. So, you know, you can learn more and connect with me in other ways or actually live um, over on our website, thegardenersworkshop.com, right there on the homepage. There's a connect with Lisa. It shows all my, where I'm live each week, where you can submit questions and um, I just ask you to venture over there and see how we can connect even more. So, I am actually sitting upstairs in my studio with my chair facing, looking out over the cool flower garden, which is covered, I would say, about 60 or 70 percent with snow right now. It is um, our afternoons get our it's really sunny. So the snow melts a little bit in the afternoons, but we're still pretty cold. I mean, it's below 30 here, so it's not really melting quite so much. And I did take a little walk around this morning to kind of take inventory. And I actually did that same inventory before this storm came. So I would have a better feel of like, okay, if something doesn't come out of the storm, am I really sure that it looked really great when it went into the storm? That was a question that I really, I felt like I knew the answer, but I needed like some, right, some real concrete information. And I want to say that my suspicion was confirmed. Those plants, and when I'm, I'm not talking about different varieties of cool flowers. I'm talking about just a plant. Plants that were happy and healthy and well-established going into the storm, it appears that they've all come out, as best as I can tell out there. Even ones that I felt like were way too big, and I, I had set myself up to lose them. I have some Godisha that I thought for sure, you know, it was just, I just didn't have time to cut it back before the snow came, and so it just laid down, and it looks pretty alive to me this morning. Um, but those things that I felt like were already questionable, um, which primarily the one that I'm really knowing I'm going to have to restart, is calendula. Calendula, um, which is pot marigold also, is one of the very earliest spring bloomers on our farm. And so there is a great benefit to getting it fall planted in time to get it really well established. So you can have, I mean, it'll provide like zinnia-like, daisy-like flowers very early. Sometimes we even get them the end of March out of our field. Well, you're obviously not going to get that if you very early spring plant them. So I do suspect that all the calendula is gone, but that was because we planted puny plants for a multitude of reasons, which we won't go into. They were planted late, so they didn't get to recover very much before cold weather came. And lo and behold, they appear to be gone now. And you know, now that I'm saying it all out loud, why would I expect anything else? And that's one of the tips that I have to share with you is now when you're suffering through these kinds of situations is the best time to sit down and write on that big calendar 
when are you supposed to order your cool flower seeds? You know, side note, we, ta we order about a year in advance now. When should you have your seeds on hand so you have them on time to start indoors and or to sow them out in the garden? You know, it's all about timing, y'all. And right now, when you're at the rawest, while you're worried to death that you're losing, you need to mark this year's calendar so it doesn't happen to you again. But let me tell you the upside of losing stuff. I have already, y'all, <laughs> I have started more very early spring planting seeds to be transplanted out when the time comes than I have room for. Is there any surprise from anybody over that? Um, you know, self-control on seed starting does not get any easier, even though you've been doing it for two and a half decades. So that says to me when I'm out there walking around, the pain, the stab when I see a blank spot on the bed that, you know, there doesn't appear to be anything left there. I tell you who another um, suspect of loss is, but they proved me wrong last year, is Billy Ball's Craspedia. Um that is, I'm on the edge, I think, of winter hardiness for them because they are very healthy looking. Um, but they appeared that the top vegetation is gone. Um, anyway, what I see now is not just, oh, shoot, I lost a crop. I now think, oh, man, now I've got room to plant some of these plants that I did not plan ahead for. Um, so that does... Um, help to ease the pain. But I also want to say that if you had plants that were puny going into winter and this winter weather, whether that means snow, ice, plummeting low temperatures, um, you know, don't be surprised that they may not come out. And the other thing is, you know, I typically, except for experiments that I'm trying to test stuff, I typically as a grower field grower, you know, remember that. I don't grow anything that's not winter hardy in my zone. It just takes too much work and effort and chance. And I just find that there's way too much other stuff that is winter hardy that I can fall plant, which is what it, where the biggest bang for your buck is. Um, so I have um, those things that I've lost. Can't calendula, um, I get told you why we lost that. Billy balls, it's yet to be seen. And I tell you, another wounded victim is our Ami Magus. Um, both of them, Ami Green Mist and Ami Graceland, they seem to have taken a hit. But I also, and the party's not over yet, so they may, you know, regrow. Um, so we'll see. But that's kind of how things are shaping up around here. And so based on some emails that we've received and DMs on social media and people's just comments, I just thought I would run through a few things um, to help clear the air for people a little bit more. Because, you know, gardening and farming in cold winter weather is very different than spring and summer gardening. And so we have to kind of think a little bit differently. So, here is the one that I think is becoming really apparent to a lot of people, me included, y'all, by starting more seeds than I have beds ready for. Typically, for most of us, very early spring planting happens or should happen, the optimal time, is six to eight weeks before your last historic spring frost. My last historic spring frost is April 15th, which means eight weeks back is Valentine's Day, February 14th. So we always know that we try to have our seedlings, transplants grown up, ready to go to the garden during that window of Valentine's to March 1st. Well, for us here, we typically are cold. The ground is wet. The ground is sometimes frozen. Sometimes there's snow. This is not the time of the year that you can work your soil. And so the way that you can embrace the cool flower concept is you must prepare those planting areas last fall. Just like for the people that were fall planting, you prepare, but instead of planting, you're just preparing your bed and setting it up to go through winter empty. And when I say preparing it to go through winter, that means you're, 
you're covering the bed with some kind of mulch, some kind of mulch film, a way to keep all of those winter weeds from sprouting. And y'all, there are as many winter growing weeds, which are just cool season hardy annuals of the kind that we don't want, as there are cool flowers. So it is a major um, problem if you don't do that. So nobody, I just, not many people can actually prepare soil at this time of the year. Um, and unfortunately, those folks that are just getting dialed in to the cool flower concept that are now starting plants, and now they're sending messages saying, how, when can I prepare my soil? Well, you know, the learning curve is that should have been done last fall. That is not helping you now. I realize that. But I'm saying that's not the way it's that it's intended to go. Um, I don't have a whole lot of help for you if you don't have your spot prepared and the soil is really wet, except, you know, if you're no-till, that's the best situation because those beds are already bet made. They typically are the driest thing on your farm um, because they are raised and lifted and you can put some um, top it off with a couple of inches of compost or um, fine mulch and plant right into them. But in a conventional garden, it's very difficult if you have not prepared the way. So that's um, another key is preparing for very early spring planting in the fall, then set the bed up so that you don't grow winter weeds. And um, for us, I've even done things like put silage tarps down over those beds. And when we have snow, um, you know, when the sunny afternoons, just like now, that are still below freezing, but when the sun comes out, they melt the highest part of the bed. You know, the tops of my beds are melting, but the pathways aren't. Um, where it kind of loosens the, so the snow up a little bit. You know, if you take advantage of those sunny afternoons, you can go out oftentimes and pull the tarp back. If You know, if you've got 24 inches of snow, because I'll hear from that person, um, it's not going to work. But for those that have just a few inches, um, that is a viable opportunity to do that. Um, when is the t the optimal time to plant? So the six to eight week window, whether we're talking about very early spring planting, like, you know, that we're preparing for now, or even back in the fall, the six to eight week window is intended to allow enough time in the fall for those pl transplants to either get well established before cold, or when you sow seeds at the six to eight weeks before fall frost, um, it allows those seeds to germinate and get settled in as a little transplant. Or in very early spring, that six to eight week window provides to the cool season hardy annual what it really, really wants. They want to get established into cool soil, cool to cold soil, actually, before they have to face the heat and humidity um, and sun of summer and spring where all of a sudden they have to start growing vegetation, growing stems, and doing a multitasking, which really nobody does multitasking very well, y'all. Um, so that's what that window of opportunity is. So to have your planting area all set up, kind of making a, a cozy place to plant your transplants into, and I will say here, I typically do not direct sow in very early spring because frankly it's just not warm enough out there. If you wait for the warm enough conditions then you've lost that six to eight week window before frost for those plants to become well established. So the whole point is that you can plant cool season hardy annuals. All of us typically can plant any of the cool season hardy annuals up to six to eight weeks before last frost, because even if that cool season hardy annual is not winter hardy in your zone, it can take a few weeks of frost and freeze and below freezing temperatures. It's the long winter haul of that, that those that aren't winter hardy where you are, that's what they cannot take. Um, and so, 
I'm just reviewing my notes here of the fear that folks have, particularly those people that are in, you know, zones three and four and five where, you know, you have fewer choices for fall planting, so you're doing more planting now. They fear putting those plants outdoors um, when it is still dropping below freezing or is below freezing outside. Um, cool season hardy annuals can take below freezing. You know, it doesn't do to them what it does to warm season tender annuals. But particularly um, when you create this cozy environment out there, which you, that's part of, you know, giving your cool flowers the best. For us, what does that mean? We make our beds for transplants. We cover the beds with Bio 360 with the black side up, which means that the soil is warmed just a smidgen more than if it wasn't there. And then when we go to plant in the spring, very early spring, um, we also use hoops and covers. And y'all, that just creates this toasty little spot in there. They are blocked from wind. The row cover, because of that, on sunny days, concentrates the heat that warms up the surface because of the black film that's there. Um, it just, they do really, really great. And while, um, you know, we've had a lot of questions about hardening off, there is definitely a big difference between hardening off cool season hardy annuals different than it is with warm season tender annuals. So this is speaking to just cool season hardy annuals. When you are planting your transplants into those conditions that I just described, a cozy spot that you have deliberately created out in the garden, black film, hoops and row covers ready to put on just after you plant the same day. I do very little hardening off. We take them literally almost from the grow room straight out to the garden. Sometimes I'll let them sit out under the carport for a day or so. It really depends on our schedule. But when you're planting them into a hooped row covered environment um, that's blocking the wind, concentrating the sunshine, um, and just giving them the best of it all and their nice, healthy little transplants, they'll hit the ground running. We, we have done that for years. Now, if it's not such a cozy show out there, you know, if you're trying to make do, which I totally get it, this is what makes you better than year after year, right? If you're not planting into that cozy situation, then you do need to prepare your plants more. Um, and you would follow that same hardening off process that you do with warm season, meaning you would have a protected area. In winter, that means protect from wind. Um, I have a fence around my carport for that very reason. Put them out. When the heat of the, you know the sunniest part of the day for me that's mid morning, they'll get mid they'll get mid morning to lunchtime sunshine. Then they'll spend the afternoon kind of shaded, but it's still cold and it's blocked from wind. And then they get a little bit more sunshine. And then I might bring them in at night, particularly if it's dropping um, in the low thirties and below. Bring them back in. Do that for several days and just extend how long they're out there. Um, that may help you in that situation. So in a compromised planting situation, I would do exactly like I do for warm season. I would take, you know, seven to 10 days to get them acclimated before you throw them out to the wolves, right? But if you're planting into that cozy situation that you have deliberately created for this very time, then um, I do very little hardening off. I mean, a day or two at most, if at all, and then they move right out into the garden. They're planted, hooped, and row covered um, and do really, really well. And then the other thing that I wanted to add is that when you're growing those cool season hardy annuals that are known to be winter hardy in your winter hardiness zone, row covers are not required. Row covers are a benefit, and there are many benefits um, because I get that question a lot. Do I have to cover them? Well, not if you're, it depends on what you're growing. For instance, this year, um, you know, rudbeckias are a big crop for us. I think we have five or six different ones planted out in our garden. Rudbeckias are known to be winter hardy to zone five. So this year, I elected to not put any hoops 
on that bed. I mean, why should I, right? If they're winter hardy to zone five, I'm in zone seven B slash eight A. So it's way hardier than what my zone typically gets. So I thought I'm gonna really test out and see how they do. And they're coming through like a champ. So I would say if you're in zone six, seven, eight or nine, and you plant an entire bed of Rudbeckia, you don't even have to worry about row covering it. I think row cover is a real um, pacifier for us as growers and gardeners, and it makes us feel better, but there really are some that truly do not need it. Now, what does it benefit? So why do I use so much row cover? Because the benefit of protecting my plants from the cold winter wind Definitely, I feel like aids in my plants perhaps blooming a little bit earlier and they come through without um, so much tattering of the green of their foliage um, and it just makes them a little bit healthier and I think it actually helps them to grow a little bit more. But it also protects them from varmint. You know, we have a major squirrel problem here now. Now that that farm next to me um, is now in houses, that's one of the biggest um, results of that is you never would find a squirrel out in my garden three years ago because of the raptor presence on my farm. Well, the raptor presence, that's hawks, um, owls, and um, those types of big birds that just peck, pick off those squirrels left and right. They never had the nerve to venture out into my garden. Well, that's not the case now. We're hoping that we do see hawks, but we just don't have them sitting around on our fence line and up on our raptor post waiting for them. Um, so we have found that row covers have been essential um, to help deter the squirrels from even knowing that there's plants under there that they can upheave, um, as well as for deer. And it also helped me to train my golden retrievers to stay off the beds. Dogs do not understand all those things that we're telling them, y'all. They see the row cover and walk around it. Um, so it is really for that. So friends, I hope that, you know, first off, we appreciate your questions that you send in and your DMs. Um, we're using those um, to help guide with the things that I talk about. And you can learn more um, about cool flowers. And I totally get it. It is such a different concept, y'all. Over on the gardenersworkshop.com, and I'll put the link below. Um, I did a series called The Cool Season Flower Chronicles. Sorry, y'all, I'm writing this down so I don't forget. Um, and that was a five part, a five video series addressing all the questions that I get with people not understanding different concepts of cool flowers. So this is kind of this landing page, the Cool Season Flower Chronicles, has become a clearinghouse for all of these additional resources that I'm doing for cool flowers. So if you go to thegardenersworkshop.com, go on over to the Learning Center and go to my Field and Garden blog and podcast and go to the Cool Flowers category, it's right at the top. And there are there's a planting guide there. There is um, a couple of webinars that I've done that you can request. The videos are there. there the access to all the, the seeds is there. Um, it's just kind of, I understand. There are people that watch them over and over and over again. And then just one day it clicks, you get it, you understand, um, and it'll all get easier for you. So friends, we appreciate your support. We love being here for you guys um, through the storms and through the spring and the summer. And um, Cool Flowers literally added a third of the cash crop to my operation, growing it out in the field. Um, can't imagine what it can do for you if you had structures um, and the extensions. And um, so I love talking to you about it and sharing and friends. Um, till we meet again. Ciao.